If I wanted to get all philosophical for this video, I'd pose the question, what's the difference between something being your favorite game of all time and the best game of all time? And also, is there even such a thing as the best game of all time? Now, personally, I don't think there is a singular one-size-fits-all answer to the best game of all time. This is a medium, well, like any art, really, that's wrapped up in tastes and perspectives to make such a declarative statement. So, for each individual person speaking for themselves, the line between a favorite game and the best game you've ever played isn't that worry. Then that brings up other questions about what metrics you're using to make that declaration. As in, are you the type who cares about the competency of the design only, the replayability, what the game means to you personally, or some mix of all of the above? For me, this varies on a game-to-game -game basis. Some games being that deeply meaningful and others just being so well designed and fun to replay that this alone does it for me. I don't even have one singular favorite game, since the question brings in so many different answers to the forefront of my mind. But if there's one constant is that whenever pondering the matter, my mind always goes back to Sly 2, Band of Thieves from Sucker Punch Productions. Sly 2 was first released on the PS2 18 years ago on September 14th of 2004. One of the greatest years in gaming history, if you ask me, just by looking at the sheer volume of all-time classic games that got released then. Slide 2 was not the first video game I ever played, however, it was definitely one of the most important. I'm someone who only started playing games because my three-year-old self was jealous that my sister had a Game Boy Advance and I didn't, so I got one and played whatever Scooby-Doo game was on it. My uncle was also big into playing games on his NES like Mario 3 or games on his PS1 like Tekken 2, so I was always interested in and surrounded by computers and games. When we got a PS2 for the first time, it was more of the same. Games like The Incredibles, the video game, and licensed stuff. I had played Jack 2 and Jack 3 before any Sly game, which I had done videos on this summer. Go watch them, they were really good. But as a kid, those games were way too challenging to get nearly as invested as I did with Sly. I won't forget being at Target and then becoming instantly magnetized to the cover art of the game. I didn't set up the fact that I think Sly's a well-designed character in the previous video for no reason. I was immediately drawn to him the second I saw this box art with Sly's charming self grinning front and center. I have framed posters all over my room of the games and other media I found the most meaning in, and Sly 2's cover art is one of them. Without Sly Cooper, and Sly 2 specifically, I don't think I'd be where I am today, or even the same person. This game, for all the reasons I'll discuss today, made me into someone who appreciated video games on a deeper, creative level, teaching me that games could be something more than what I had already seen and experienced thus far. So, the challenge of doing this video is the same as Sly 1 and Sly 3, multiplied by a factor of 10, because this isn't just the third time I'm doing this game in the last seven years, it's also my third time trying to explain why this game is one I hold so dear after almost 20 years of playing it, replaying it, thinking about it, and all that. I suppose the pressure is self-inflicted, Nevertheless, I think these are videos I need to do because of the fact that I didn't know what I was doing the first time in 2016, and was a pseudo-intellectual prick the second time a year later. I jokingly said third time's the charm, right, in last week's Sly 1 video, but in all honesty, I really do want this to be the last time I go over these games and leave my definitive stamp on this series in a way I can look back on and feel proud of years down the line as I move on to other subjects. I guess if I succeed, it's up to you guys in the audience. So with that established, it's time to get started. And what's a better way to get going than by picking up where we left off last week? Sly 1 was, and still is, an incredible game. An inspiring effort from an up-and-coming game dev, working hard to create a phenomenal character and an interesting world to go along with him. It's an experience that I could go back to any day and have a good time with. It's got such a great atmosphere, memorable story, and solid gameplay. The only areas it got flack in were that it was too short, which I definitely agree with. Well, maybe the game itself wasn't too short the issue was the content which is becoming less and less consistent as the game went on making the game feel like it peaked too early be that as it may i do love me some sly one always have and i always will the game did get a plethora of praise as a result of its characters and world building and sly one thankfully sold well enough to be worthy of a sequel and when looking at everything pertaining to this game one of the things most clear about it to me, right after looking in depth on the first game, was how they zeroed in on what the appeal of the Sly Cooper series was, making it even more appealing than they did before. Many of my early talking points will focus on this idea of refining an already solid vision. One of the words they used when promoting Sly 1 was that they were trying to make the game as thiefy as possible. They defined that as anything and everything that makes the player feel the most like a thief. Whether that be dodging spotlights or stealing treasure. But for this game, they wanted an entire gameplay model that revolved around the idea of making the player feel like a thief, crafting a structure that would feel unique to the Sly Cooper series. They wanted Sly 2 to feel like a cartoon heist film. The opening minutes of the game made a promising pitch. This time, as the game box promises, the entire Cooper gang is involved with this massive break-in on a museum in Cairo. The prologue being this mission. 
it serving multiple purposes. Obviously giving the player a non-threatening way to get into the mechanics of the game. Although on that note, on my first playthrough, it took me what felt like forever to realize you had to jump on this thing here to make progress right at the beginning. Although that's going off of the attention span of kid me, so it's probably like two minutes. As I was saying, the prologue shows that the payoff of every level in the game was going to be a big collaborative mission between the Cooper gang members who would all provide an essential role in the task being accomplished. Here we see Bentley hacking into the computers to get Sly past security and Murray using his abilities to create an entrance for Sly to use. What also warrants discussion is that plopping us back into the story allows the game to reintroduce us to these characters. Sly being as cool, collected, and confident as ever. No, Sly, I'm the wizard, and you're sitting duck. I read you loud and clear, lizard. No, I, I'm... forget it, you're not taking this seriously. Yeah, I'm not. Bentley getting out into the field for the first time do the kinds of things Sly and Murray just can't, being more nervous than usual. Murray getting the biggest overhaul. His character was easily the low light of Sly 1 from a writing standpoint since he just got pushed to the sidelines while they were developing the game. So by the end, he just felt there, not really adding much to Sly's world besides being a goof. So now they decided to change it for the better, make Murray the hippo, the muscle of Sly's crew. I mean, Sly's the leader, an agile raccoon thief, Bentley's the brains, a turtle whose whole arc is coming out of his shell. Why not make the hippo the strong one? By creating these solid archetypes that each member of the team excels in, it allows every member of the Cooper gang to feel distinct and complementary to one another at the same time. Each one has strengths and weaknesses the others do not. Extra important because you're going to be playing as all these guys. However, it doesn't feel like a rewrite of Sly 1, just an expansion on the foundation that game laid. The first Sly was mostly about establishing Sly as a character, his motivations, his backstory, and his growth on that mission. Sly 2 is about those things as well, but now that Sly's origin is said and done, it's easier to integrate the rest of the crew more, also building off of what was there. I mean, Bentley never had to step up before he needed to save Sly from Clockwork's death trap, so naturally, that would increase his confidence a little bit. What was there in Sly 1 was that Murray wanted to be like Sly, but obviously didn't have the skills or bravery to do it. By the end, he had also dabbled in the missions a bit, channeling all his will to be cool like Sly in his new persona and design as the Murray, the powerhouse of the Cooper gang. Props to the team at Sucker Punch for still having Chris Murphy continue to play Murray even with this different direction for him. It's improving Sly 1 while feeling natural at the same time. The prologue of Sly 2 being an exciting hook to get players into it. Sly 1's being a bit short in hindsight compared to 2 where you have funny lines and bits, different character interactions, and this big bombastic chase scene with the whole gang getting away from Carmelita and then the entire squad of police to this action-packed music. With an intro like that, I'm now invested. I mean, I had never played anything like it before. A mix of feeling sneaky, pulling off this big job with characters this stand out, with all the action you'd expect from a cool video game like Sly busting through the window and running from rooftop to rooftop dodging Carmelita's shots while Bentley and Murray are in a high-speed chase down in the ground. It's pretty cool, leading to the first animated scene that establishes the context. Two years have passed since Sly defeated Clockwork in Sly 1. However, his robotic pieces have been salvaged by a museum and the Cooper gang set out to steal them to make sure Clockwork could never return. But they learn from Carmelita and the new Interpol agent, Constable Neela, that the parts were already stolen by a mysterious group called the Claw Gang. The Cooper gang's mission is to track them all down and destroy Clockwork once and for all. I don't know what's in my future, but I won't let it be a repeat of my past. Already from the start of Sly 2, so many things are better than they were in Sly 1. I don't mean for this to be a, here's a list of things Sly 2 does better than 1 video. I suppose it's natural given that this is a sequel and you'd want to compare them, but I'm just saying that I don't want Sly 1 to seem like it's not good. I just spent 32 minutes last week going into why I thought the game was so great. My aim is really just to show why I think Sly 2 is such a good refinement of the brand, Sly Cooper. Another example are these cutscenes. Sly's comic influences were evident in the last game, but while editing that video, I couldn't help noticing the motion elements in those cutscenes just look kinda... cheap. Like how this image of Sly is used here and then is then panned across the screen with a different background layer. With Sly 2, the art style is much cleaner, actually resembling what you'd see in mainstream comics. The characters look more on model, especially Sly himself who had these yellow gloves and black shoes in the Sly 1 cutscenes, despite that obviously not being what his final design looked like. And generally, I think the motion elements of these comic book cutscenes look more cinematic. And less stock. Just higher production value across the board. This is also a thing outside of the animated scenes, as the cutscenes in-game are better with different camera angles from the usual A-cam, B-cam, and more movement. The actual animation in the characters is still nothing to write home about, relying on a couple of pre-baked animations that the game reuses repeatedly throughout. 
So it doesn't compare to Jack 2 or Ratchet & Clank 2, which both released the previous year, or the games in those series that released alongside Sly 2, but I think this more than gets the job done, showing how the team had evolved from the development of Sly 1. Something that's seen most clearly when discussing the game's structure. One of the lines that's always stuck out to me from the behind the scenes movie was when Chris Bensel said, This game we really wanted it a lot more to be about doing something rather than just going somewhere. And as a result, one of the things we really focused on this game was to really work on the AI. The first Sly was a straightforward point-to-point B platformer in the same vein as Crash Bandicoot. As I went over in the Jack 2 video, many of the older game design tropes weren't as popular in the early 2000s with games like Grand Theft Auto 3 ruling the roost. Sly 2 wasn't as obviously inspired by GTA 3 like Jack 2 was, but it did take this linear gameplay and adapt it into a mission-based sandbox style. The Sly Cooper twist is how the game wanted to arrange these missions to be like a heist movie. Each of the eight areas see the Cooper gang in a different location as you must do several missions to set up a grand heist at the end of every stage. The first episode is my favorite example, where you begin by taking some recon photos as Sly to get the layout of Dimitri's operation for Bentley, and then you have to tail Dimitri as Sly to learn the passcode for the aqua pump room so Murray can sabotage it in another mission, or how Bentley has to drop the giant disco ball in order to create a massive enough impact to shake the nightclub's front peacock sign loose from its moorings. That's not every mission you do in the first level, but my point is made. Each mission ties into each other as you gradually prepare for the massive heist where all three characters work together to pull off the big job, paying off the little ones you'd done before. Like Operation Hippo Drop, where Bentley uses his bombs to destroy the bridge to Rajan's guest house so that the guards will be lured there. Sly then distracts the crowd in the ballroom by wearing a disguise and dancing with Carmelita. And with that distraction in place, Murray can drop in from the ceiling to get the clockwork wings from the statue they're displayed on. I just used Episodes 1 and 2 as an example, however, every mission in the game serves a purpose to the larger heist that episode ends with. I just love when a game makes all the things you do feel important, even if some missions are arbitrary like destroying this elephant-powered satellite array in Episode 3. Guess this mission didn't need to exist from a gameplay perspective, but in the story at least, Rajan is using this to collect data on the Cooper Gang, giving it an urgent feeling, allowing the devs to set up the fact that the spice the Claw Gang uses makes people really aggressive. Although, I suppose I can return to that later. The thing I find most appealing about the way Sly 2 is structured is that there's no game quite like it. Large open spaces obviously existed in other games, but not ones where the little missions saw you trade off between equally cool and skilled characters to pull off a big heist requiring all their skills. It's definitely effective at feeling like a heist movie, something no game was ever really trying to do before. So its gameplay is unique to Sly Cooper and heavily fits the series rather than standard level-to-level -level action. The eight mini hub worlds you explore are solidly designed as well. The developer stated in an interview with GameSpy that they designed each area to be like Disney World, where areas are centered around memorable focal points that are always in view. I think each of the hub worlds are all the proper size and scale with, as the developers promised, memorable landmarks that make it easy to orient yourself in regards to where you are. Such as the re-education tower in episode 5 standing tall above the rest of the buildings so you know where you're going to be going from that alone. Although missions are clearly marked with the holographic markers that go high in the sky with a press of the L3 button for extra guidance. And if you want more exploration, you can collect the 30 clue bottles hidden in each area that are satisfying to get, as you always have to explore every nook and cranny to find them all. Sometimes you might get stuck in the last two or three, which might feel annoying in the moment. However, once you get them all, you look forward to the reward, which is always a useful upgrade to Sly's abilities. Like a fast electric spin that kills enemies in one hit, or the long toss, which allows the characters to toss things further away than you could before. Speaking of those characters, in this game you'll be playing as Sly, Bentley, and Murray. To start with the leading man, Sly is very similar to how he played in Sly 1. He retains all the major platforming abilities learned in that game, but has expanded combat to include an uppercut that leads to a takedown on unsuspecting enemies and a charged spin attack. What's different from the last game is that you can control the camera freely with the right analog stick. The first game only allowed you to move the camera left and right because you wouldn't really need to be looking up and down in the linear levels that Sly 1 had. Here you'd need to be seeing what's above and below you to properly get around the areas. But as for the mechanics, Sly feels much better to jump around as. In the first game, when jumping, you were pretty much committed to that jump. The only thing you could do to change that trajectory was using the double jump and pulling the stick back to stop forward momentum. In Sly 2, it just feels much less restricted when jumping as you can jump forward, but double jump into a backflip or a side jump just makes Sly feel much more agile. All the characters can sprint by holding down R1 just at the cost of alerting guards to your whereabouts. I always remember the sprint because of the fact that when starting the game for the first time, I recall thinking the default speed was kind of slow and thought there must be a way to go faster. I couldn't consult the manual because I could barely read, so my mom had to read it for me. And the exact moment we did that was when this happened. Why you can hold down the R1 button while walking to break into a fast run, but be careful, as this is sure to be loud enough to alert any guards in the vicinity. 
the timing of that was just always something funny I'll remember about that first playthrough. So when looking at the other two characters, how they were going to handle was the biggest mystery going into Sly 2. The devs simply stated that their goal was to make all three of them fun to play and have missions and make the player feel like their inclusion was necessary. Therefore, all three characters basically play the exact same with minor differences between them. For example, the control scheme is the same between all three playable teammates. So if you know how to play as Sly, you can easily play as Murray. Sly is the only one who can climb on things and run on ropes and such, with good, albeit not great, combat ability. Missions for Sly are the ones requiring these skills, like tailing someone from the rooftops or pickpocketing something. Bentley is the weakest on the team, taking the longest to defeat all the enemies you come across, which makes avoiding them the most important thing. But without the agility of Sly, you rely on his gadgets to make up the difference as Bentley uses his dart gun to put enemies asleep from a distance so he can get by them or use his bombs to blow them away. He focuses on missions needing demolition or computer hacking skills. Murray is the strongest of the group, so the stealth is the least important for him. Without exception, Murray can kill every enemy in two hits. And it feels really fun to do as every punch you land causes the controller to vibrate so you really feel the impact. Even more than the Batman 66 pow and bam text that appear on defeated enemies already did. Murray doesn't really have much going on when playing him besides that. Missions focusing on destroying something heavy, defeating enemies, or moving something large from one spot to another. While it sounds very simple, and it is, I suppose, Sly 2 balances it all well, though. Sly is the character you'll play as for a majority of the game. He's the main character and the most fun to play as, after all. In Episode 3, there are eight missions before the heist. Five of them star Sly. Two of them star Bentley, and the last one is for Murray. While Bentley's total mission count sounds low, most of his missions are pretty long and involve platforming and hacking computers, so you definitely don't feel a loss there. Murray's the character you'll play as the least in the game because his gameplay is the most simple. However, for the most part, it doesn't feel like you're missing out since every time you do play as him, it's explosively cathartic as you pummel the enemies in your path. When most of the game is sneaking around as Sly and Bentley. I'm not saying there isn't room for improvement, as Murray definitely could have used, say, two missions per level, but the way it is in Sly 2 works well. Sly is also the most useful when getting around the levels. As I said, he's the only one who can interact with pipes and ropes and such, meaning he can get around in more fun ways than Bentley and Murray who have to go on the ground to get up on the rooftops via other means. So playing as them less helps with reducing commutes between missions, although you do get some useful upgrades to help out with this. The clue bottles aren't the only path to upgrades in this game, as they added an entire system for it that once more makes the player really feel like a thief. Sly can now pickpocket guards for their loose change, and if their pocket is shining, they can swipe valuables off of those guards. At the safe house, the player can use Bentley's computer to access ThiefNet, where you sell your stolen goods in exchange for more coins. In the hubs, you can also find treasure you can bring back to the safe house to sell for a much higher value. You spend all these coins, not on lives and hit points because Sly 2 removed lives and gave every character a health bar. Instead, you spend them on useful upgrades like Sly's smoke bomb, which instantly ends the alert phase if you get caught, provided you can get away before the enemies catch you again. Sly has a couple upgrades that are required for progression, such as the alarm clock gadget at the end of Episode 7 to distract the judges at the Lumberjack games, and best of all, the paraglider required in Episode 5 that Sly uses to glide through the air and extend his jumps with. A series stable because of how simple and effective it was in Sly 2, giving every area a sense of scope as you can take it all in from high above the ground. For Bentley, nothing is required, but there are some good ones like the sleep bombs that come in handy when crowded by a lot of enemies, or the ones that brought on this discussion in the first place. Bentley's adrenaline burst that makes you move much faster for a few seconds, and his hover pack that grants Bentley temporary flight, albeit with a short duration and a low speed, but it can get you up to higher areas without having to take the long way around. Murray's stuff isn't super useful though. The Fists of Flame kill enemies in one hit, and his other upgrades all make destroying enemies more fun and varied, although you can get through the game without all that. The only one that really comes in handy is the Atlas Strength, which allows Murray to sprint and jump while carrying things. It makes the missions like capturing General Clawfoot, these bear cubs, and luring old Grizzleface much simpler. The game gives you a contrast with this since you're forced to complete the Ruby Exchange mission in Episode 3 without this upgrade since it's not unlocked until later. So when it is, you feel the incentive to buy it. You'd hope Murray's launch move would be as useful as Bentley's hover pack, but this one is quite lame. Murray just looks like he's passing gas and uses that to propel himself in the air, just with the pitiful distance compared to what Sly and Bentley could do. So that one was a dud that could have been much better, but besides that, this is a solid roster of upgrades that gives players something to work towards throughout the game outside of the core missions. Having said that, Sly 2 is already well on its way to being a good game with its premise, its art design, brandability, structure, and gameplay. But the glue that holds this game together is its story. Sly 1 was a pretty simple story arc that suited its gameplay-focused design well. Each level, you'd be introduced to the villain, go through some stages to stop them, and then move on to the next one until the day was done. Game had clear character arcs, but I'm saying that structurally it's predictable. Sly 2 is a pretty subversive sequel. 
With that said, it's important to establish what your expectations are before I can talk about them being subverted. Slide 2 starts off pretty much the same as the first game. We have new characters to play as, a new competing law operative love interest in Constable Neela who's willing to actively help Sly and friends out if it means getting her own job done, and the game has all this gameplay to get to grips with. So the first level is dedicated towards getting the players used to all the new dynamics at play in Sly 2 while being set up like a Sly 1 level. Dimitri is the villain, you spend several missions finding a way into his printing press room, you beat him up, get the clockwork tail feathers, and the Cooper gang gets away as Carmelita arrives after the fact to toss him in jail. Episode 2 begins with the same idea. Rajan is our villain, he's got the clockwork wings, and we have to get to them while they're at display in front of a crowded ballroom. I remember on the first playthrough I was expecting it all to end with a boss fight with Rajan and we move on to the next level, except things don't play out like that. The Cooper gang pulls off the mission and escapes with the clockwork wings, however Rajan escapes from the premises. So while the cutscene still ends with goofy antics with the gang like always, Sly is left with a feeling of dread as Rajan is still at large. I was happy the guys got to unwind, but Rajan was still out there. And somehow, I knew things were about to get tough. So now, who knows how this game is going to be structured? Anything could happen next. Episode 3 sees the gang track Rajan to a rundown temple base in the jungle where he's keeping hold of the clockwork heart. The whole heist built up to this moment where Sly and Neela take on Rajan, only for her to be on his side. Neela, now! Sorry. What are you doing? As Sly gets injured, leaving Murray to battle Rajan, which is this huge moment for him to show just how strong he actually is. The boss with Rajan is one of my favorites because you can just toss his guards right at him, causing him to fall over, and you can then pick up Rajan, just chuck him right at the electric fence. It's pretty cathartic. But then, Neela walks in with Carmelita and the Contessa, a high-ranking prison warden of Interpol. They're there to capture Sly, Murray, and Rajan and toss them all in jail. To make matters more surprising, Neela uses Sly tricking Carmelita into being part of their dance distraction scheme against her and frames her for being in league with the Cooper gang. So Carmelita is now getting tossed into the slammer alongside Sly and Murray. This moment will live on in my mind rent free for the rest of my life. Sly 2 completely changed my expectations for what video games were. I think this is one of the first plot twists I had ever seen. Normally, kids media, including Sly 1, would follow a simple arc. But this game was the first time I saw a story where characters can go from being on your side to not. This made me rethink everything I had seen. Neela wasn't helping Sly at all before, she was setting the gang up for this moment, shaking up the status quo even more by tossing Carmelita into the slammer. Back in episode 2, Sly used Neela to distract the crowd halfway through as a practice round for when he does it with Carmelita later. Neela knowing this, and pointed it out. Are you using me to get at old Ironsides? Yes I am. Do you mind? Not at all. And she was totally okay with it because then she knew she'd use this opportunity to frame Carmelita and get her out of the picture. It's like, wow, layers upon layers. Sly is the personification of cool and yet he's been emotionally duped. No one likes to have their affections played with. I know I certainly don't. Look, Neela, as soon as this India job is over, why don't you and I go out on the town? We'll dance through Bollywood and eat curry all night long. I'll keep in mind. Episode 3 shows that Sly has started to have some genuine feelings for Neela that she continued to exploit. And? And we're on for that date in Bollywood. Knowing she was going to betray Sly immediately after. I mean, how shocking is all that if you've never seen a story go in a direction like that before? I mean, there was the second season of Justice League, but I was so young that I could barely understand what was going on. I just liked the superheroes. This was something you had to actively be engaged with and it took me totally by surprise. Now I have literally no idea what direction the story is going in and it's for the better. Because of how well written the game is, you want to see what happens to the characters. Sly may be the title character, but Bentley is definitely the star of the show. He went from zero field work to being out there alone in Sly 2, and the writers didn't skip a beat. At the beginning of the game, once he's the one who actually has to do a mission, his usual tone, I share in your enthusiasm, but before we hit the inside, we'll need to do a little reconnaissance work, is completely different. Hey Bentley, how you holding up out there in the field? Fine. Fine, I'm just fine. I just need to bob all the pillars supporting that disco ball and I can get out of here. What's with taking out the disco ball? Its impact will shake the nightclub's front peacock side loose from its morning. Look, I can't talk now, I've gotta keep moving, keep safe! On that note, the way he explains missions to Murray is different from how he does to Sly. There are three of them out here, and I need you to take them out. Gotta appreciate the little details like that. 
as I was saying, once it's been established that Bentley's uncomfortable with field work, you start to root for him as he comes out of his shell more. Great field work, Bentley. You're really getting the hang of this. As we're then met with this plot twist where Sly and Murray are sent to jail, you're now just like, what on earth's gonna happen now? But then the cutscene goes from kinda sad to pretty exciting. The long walk out of the jungle gave me time to reflect. And with each passing step, my sense of isolation grew. Shockingly, my comrade's absence had a profound emotional effect on me. This was it. This was the true test of friendship. Upon reaching the van, my resolve was hardened. I had to save my friends. But first things first, I had to learn how to drive a stick shell. You get an entire level dedicated to Bentley as a solo operative, trying to break Sly and Murray out of the Contessa's massive prison. This being a perfect time to bust out the horror level tropes as it's supposed to be scary. Jail is not a thief's preferred place to hang out, after all. But then you're also playing in this hostile environment as the weakest character in the game as a part of his growth towards being confident on the field. When Bentley does rescue Sly, it's a cute moment because like I said, you like these characters by this point, and they make it a quiet moment that pays off Sly making fun of Bentley's code names from the beginning. Wow, you've really thought of everything. Don't I always? Yeah, you do. Thanks for busting me out. Oh, well, you know the old saying, if you can't count on a friend to bust you out of jail, what kind of a friend are they? Truer words were never said, wizard. Things get a bit serious though as Murray gets transferred to solitary confinement and is made the guinea pig for the Contessa's mind control and a test subject for the spice the Claw Gang uses that, as was foreshadowed in episode 3, makes you go into a fit of uncontrolled rage. Now, the local spice plants are illegal for good reason. Eat too many, and you'll go into a fit of uncontrolled rage. Keep that stuff away from Murray. Now this has happened as you need to snap him out of it. The team then trying to chase the Contessa down for revenge until she gets away. Don't worry, pal. We'll find her. With the three of us back together, she doesn't stand a chance. The ending cutscene of episode 4 having nothing to do with the clockwork parts of the Contessa or whatever, the game put in all this effort to make the characters and their relationships come first. So therefore, this scene is all about how happy it is to see the team fully reunited again after that prison level. This made the characters feel real to me as a kid. The fact that the game takes its time to build up to things and pay them off, have quiet moments, action scenes, funny lines, and serious moments, it's all the makings of a great story. Although I guess I haven't said too much about what the plot is. I gave the basic description much earlier in the video, I just mean that I haven't gotten the chance to talk about how great the villains are in Spy 2. I already liked the rogues gallery in Sly 1, but this just blows that game out of the water. For starters, the villains are actually working together. Dimitri ran a nightclub where the spice was distributed to the Paris public. Rajan made the spice, the clockwork heart being used as an unlimited source of energy powering his spice grinder. The Contessa also being a member of the Claw Gang, as it's revealed that she used her position as a prison warden to brainwash criminals into telling her where they've stashed their loot, further enriching herself, and is using her hypnotic suggestion knowledge to aid the Claw Gang. Then you have Jean Bassan, who uses his massive shipping empire to deliver spice all over the globe. All this being orchestrated by the mysterious Arpeggio. The Cooper Gang has walked into a full-on criminal conspiracy in this game, one that the developers masterfully crafted further showing the player's actions having an effect on the world, like how the Contessa complains that spice shipments are way down as a result of the Cooper Gang stopping Dimitri and Rajan, killing both production and distribution. The villains themselves also feel more real as well. The Claw Gang members don't even like each other that much, like how Jean Bassan, at Rajan's ball, throws shade at the spice production. That fellow is very graceful. If only you moved spice shipments as well. Oh, silence. Or how an intellectual like Arpeggio clearly thinks Jean Bassan is a dullard when talking to him over the phone. Top to bottom, it's a well thought out story. Besides the Panda King and Clockwork, I don't think Sly 1 was trying to make its villains anything more interesting than a funny or quirky boss character, but in this game though, you get these backstories and motivations from the villains that are really compelling. Such as Rajan, who grew up poor and sold illegal spice to gain massive amounts of wealth, and was at first trying to show the world how opulent he was by throwing a massive ball, but the Cooper gang ruins that and his reputation as well. So in episode 3, we see him as the crazy thug he actually is. The Contessa married a wealthy aristocrat and poisoned him to get his entire estate for herself, really making her one of the most menacing villains in the game as she'll stop at nothing to get her goals accomplished. And then you have Jean Bassan, who has a really creative backstory. He was a prospector back in the gold rush in the 1850s, but was frozen in an avalanche for over a hundred years, and now global warming has thawed him out, so he's continuing his mission to level trees in the interest of commerce like he did way back when. 
Sly even acknowledging that in his day, that wasn't considered a bad thing. The writer's going as far as to make Jean Besson racist, too. The Cooper gang installs a bug in his house and you can listen to his thoughts at the safe house. He claims that Rajan knows how to throw a party despite being a foreigner. This is more blatant with his contempt for Bentley because he's a turtle. Although, if I'm talking about bigger themes, the Claw Gang's whole scheme is essentially the drug trade. It's dolled up and presented in a kiddie way as they ship spice across the land and distribute it to paying customers. However, Rajan's backstory is that he went from rags to riches selling this illegal, addictive garbage, it having an effect on your mental state. Rajan, when you listen to the bug you planted in his office, decides to get a hit when he's stressed out. It's literally R-rated material in this game if you just change the details around and made it an AMC drama. With heroes you care about and villains that are pretty well characterized, I'm hooked. The actual writing of the dialogue is a big help with that, of course. Last week, I said the way I speak was influenced by Sly, and can you blame me? I could listen to the internal monologue of trilogy-era Sly any old day because they wrote him to be really well-spoken, despite his banterous nature. As a kid, I was enthralled with Sly, even though he was saying words I didn't understand the meaning of. Like in episode 1's opening when he's like, Dimitri now runs a nightclub on the west side. The thumpy music, colorful light shows, and a hint of danger lure in chic young patrons from far and wide. One of my favorites is when he's talking about Rajan, he says, And while he goes to great lengths to convince others of his royalty, it's mostly to convince himself. True to form, he's holding a lavish ball in his newly purchased ancestral palace. The reason? To show off his latest acquisition, the clockwork wings. I could go on all day with that, but my point is that growing up with these games, it was a thing for me to look up what some of these words meant and use them in conversation. Others, I just sort of understand the meaning of just by looking at the surrounding context. The game is full of examples like that in monologues, serious moments, and comedic ones. Of course, Kevin Miller's delivery as Sly is a massive part of that. I mean, he doesn't have to bust out the thesaurus for me to be hanging on his every word. It can be as simple as, It's a well-fortified, gothic nightmare that would make any thief run in terror. Terrible or not, that's where we're headed. Which is the note episode 5 begins on as the Cooper gang walks into a full-scale war. The Contessa was exposed as a member of the Claw Gang, so Neela got the cash allowance to wage war on her. The Cooper gang needs to get into the mix of the battle to get their hands on the Clockwork Eyes, which the Contessa is using to try and brainwash Carmelita. The game doesn't hide the fact that this journey has become personal for so many of its characters and with different relationship conflicts colliding. The Cooper gang trying to fight both Neela and the Claw Gang at once, and now Carmelita has to deal with being a fugitive herself once she's rescued by Sly. More adamant than ever that she needs to capture Sly to prove her own innocence, while Neela keeps rising the ranks of Interpol despite her mysterious allegiance. I am quite fond of this game, its character arcs and drama, which it has in abundance. Episode 5 feels like a big halfway point climax as by the end the Cooper gang just barely pulls the clockwork eyes heist off in the middle of a war zone. The main theme of the game plays in the menu, and starting in episode 5 you get this variant with more instruments to complement the ascending stakes. <laughs> I'm not sure if that's the word that really fits the point I'm conveying, but I'm trying. I've said before I'm pretty musically illiterate, so I tend to avoid the subject. I'll just say this, I don't listen to Sly music much, but it's all great. Starting in Sly 2, Peter McConnell's the main composer of the games, and he found this sound for Sly music that has this perfect noir feel to it that became the main musical style of the series throughout Sly 2, 3, and 4. Of course, I'm now obliged to mention that the game is not without flaws. In terms of gameplay and story, I really like Episode 6, where the Cooper gang disrupts Jean Besson's iron horse trains to get the clockwork stomach and the two clockwork lungs that he was using to power those trains unlimitedly. Fun fact from me was that I was taken aback by this being a snow level. It takes place in Canada, but when I was like four years old, I didn't know where Canada was or what that was, so when I heard, Jean Besson, a member of the Claw Gang and Canadian shipping baron, he owns half the trains in Canada. I got the image in my mind that it was going to be a beach level, and I got the exact opposite. Train heists are a pretty cool set piece in movies and games, so the level has that going for it. However, the writing does take a dip here because the Cooper gang fully knows Neela's evil at this point, so they decided to just, for this level only, turn her into a mustache twirling maniac when she's a cool collected manipulator for the entire rest of the game. But then you get to episode 7, which is one of my least favorites to play. 
primarily because of the hub world being designed with this massive pit in the ground that makes Bentley and Murray always have to take the long way around. And by this point in the game, we've been going on for like seven and a half hours, and so the routine of recon mission, pickpocketing mission, carrying stuff, hacking into computers, it's probably going to start feeling a little played out for a lot of players, since they aren't doing much to minimize the monotony by this point. But luckily, the story ramps up in yet another jaw-dropping moment when I first played this game. The Cooper gang tries scamming Jean Besson out of the clockwork talons he was using to level trees with ease. But they get caught and captured. As Bentley drops down in the next room to find Jean Besson, where it's revealed that while the gang was unconscious, he and his goons found and raided their hideout, stole all their clockwork parts, and sold them to Arpeggio, who can now use them to rebuild clockwork. The goal the gang was trying to prevent for the entire game. That, combined with the anti-turtle racism, gets Bentley fired up for a Jean Basson v. Bentley boss fight of leading him into traps and telling Sly which ones to activate from the console he was standing next to. It's one of the coolest moments in the story, as the obvious muscle of the claw gang gets beaten by Bentley. Like, that's just so genius. Once again, braids triumph over brawn. By this point, Bentley's arc of confidence is complete. For now. The victory is short-lived because all the parts are stolen, and as the gang stows away to get access to Arpeggio's blimp, there's no positive way to put a spin on it for the team. Our clockwork parts were gone. Looking around the inside of the battery, I knew we all felt it. Failure. They screwed up, and now all their hard work is in jeopardy, leading into the final level. This is another one I don't really like that much. I'd say it's better than the last level of Sly 1, where the game basically admitted defeat and gave you an onslaught of minigames to survive, but in Sly 2, the last level is still not that fun. I like the atmosphere. The final level doesn't take place in a burning volcano or some other obvious climactic setting. It's instead an airship, with nothing but endless clouds and stars as the backdrop, with music that feels somewhat tranquil, but sinister at the same time. The main problem with the last level is just that, while in concept the Cooper gang working together on regular missions makes the level feel more climactic, it doesn't really land when you have to pickpocket as Sly, again, hack computers as Bentley, again, and destroy boxes as Murray, again. After an entire campaign of doing that same kind of mission at least once an episode for the last several episodes. That, and the blimp is so big that the commute between areas is really long if you don't know how to time your jumps right. So the last level, whenever I get to it now, is more of a, yeah, I already played this much of the game, why would I not finish it? The climax draws further heat from fans as we find out that the clockwork frame is entirely rebuilt as we then learn that Nila was working for Arpeggio the whole time, working with and betraying whoever she needed to in order to achieve their goals of bringing back clockwork. Arpeggio then explains to Sly in painstaking detail about how Dimitri's nightclub distributed Rajan's spice to an entire city and how the Contessa helped him set up hypnotic technology powered by Northern Light Energy Jean Besson collected for Arpeggio. The main man himself didn't really care about the trivial schemes of his cohorts, but needed their help for the larger plot, knowing Sly would take them down and recover the clockwork parts, lucking out that John Bassan found and sold him the parts in the last level. The plan being to use enough hypnotic suggestion to activate the spice in the Paris public to cause them to go insane with rage like Murray did in episode 4, thus causing enough hate to bring clockwork back to life. I just described the entire plot of the villains just now, and the game made sure to explain it all, leaving no room for ambiguity. Although while it might seem fair to criticize that fact, I should admit, I don't know if my kid self would have understood all that without the game spelling it out to such a degree. The larger issue is when Nila inevitably betrays Arpeggio and takes Clockwork's power for herself and then gives herself a Ben 10 fusion name. Behold, is born. Hell bent on becoming as powerful as possible for no given reason. Nothing in Nila's backstory really connects the dots with a want to be all powerful and take over the world, it just feels kinda last minute. But I still enjoy the climax of the story quite a bit as Sly and Carmelita team up to defeat Clockla as Sly drops the truth bomb right here. You might have a new body, Nila, but you're still the low down, backstabbing coward we've beaten time and time again. This won't be any different. Be brave while you can. Now, as for the ending, it's one where I have a hard time even thinking of a way to describe the way it makes me feel, but I'll try my best. It always feels a bit sad as this final gameplay segment where you have to enter the head of Clockwork as Bentley, knowing what'll happen next. Let's get out of here! She's about to explode! Ah! My glasses! What? Bentley! I'll save you! Pick me up! I can't walk! Come on, Sly! Let's get out of here! That's the last bit of gameplay in the game. Bentley loses his ability to walk after being crushed by Clockwork's beak, and in the ending, you see that the parts are still not destroyed. Like Sly says, Despite the explosion, they remain pristine. It was as if nothing could ever hurt them. This ending is one where I might be able to recite it word for word if asked. I know I used to be able to do it when I was younger because it hit so hard. 
Everything I've mentioned thus far in the video is all coming together in this ending. Do you want intelligent writing? How about when Carmelita destroys the hate ship and that causes all of Clockwork's parts to disintegrate? Sly eloquently said, How ironic that Carmelita, a police officer, would be the one to lift the curse from the Cooper family. The menace of Clockwork would never again rise to threaten me or my children. In the first Sly game, he did everything for the sake of his family's history and reclaiming his birthright. Now, we see he did all this to protect the future of the family from this monster, and it's over. But at what cost to the present? I mentioned the expectations you'd have for children's media a couple times before in this video, and it goes doubly so for the ending. Will Sly now drop a smoke bomb and the gang gets away? No, Sly can read the room and is willing to make a sacrifice. True to her nature, she informed us that we were all under arrest. But one look at my gang told me that we were in no shape for a fast getaway. So, I offered to go peacefully in exchange for letting my friends walk. Even acknowledging how much his friends had gone through to get Sly to this point. They'd taken some bruises through all of this, but I was surprised, shocked really, to see them leave their gear behind as they walked away. Their wounds were deeper than I'd imagined. Those guys were hurting. It's all just made the characters feel more real than what I was used to. But it's not all sad news for said characters, though. Carmelita, capturing Sly, gets her job back and her name cleared. She and Sly even managing to bond a little bit over everything that's happened, leading to the final moments where Sly does manage to escape, ending with the player feeling satisfied in that, yes, the Cooper gang is in a dire strait going forward, although the ending goes to show that they're still friends at the very least, since they rigged the helicopter to allow Sly to escape. But my point is, there's a lot of intrigue in what's going to happen now. Nonetheless, the day is saved and we will see Sly again. Which is why, despite all the sad parts of the ending, I come away from this game with a smile on my face, looking forward to the finale of the series in the next game. Floating away on the night breeze, I could faintly make out Carmelita's voice. I'll find you, Cooper! I'll be seeing you soon. Now, why did I just explain so many of the things that make this story good? Did it require such an explanation of basic elements? Because yes, I am aware that foreshadowing, character arcs, and plot twists are not these supremely uncommon and surprising things to see in a story. I'm treating the story and its inner workings, and the fact that it has inner workings, like it's the hottest shit in town because it's the only way I can explain why Sly 2 is a game I'll always fondly remember to the day I die. It's because Sly 2 is an impactful game. It's not only a memorable story with these great characters, but for me, it's the fact that this was the game that introduced me to these storytelling devices that makes it a game I'll always remember and look back to whenever I'm asked what my favorite game is. I don't think Sly 2 is as replayable as Mega Man X or Resident Evil 2 Remake. I don't think the mechanics have nearly the versatility of games like Devil May Cry 5 or Metal Gear Solid 3. Sly 2's story is pretty simple in comparison to the raw emotions I get from every playthrough of The Last of Us, nor does it have the intricacy of a real great Ace Attorney case. There exist better open world games than Sly 2, better stealth games than Sly 2, better platformers, and even more interesting storylines. But that's the thing, Sly 2 will always rank high in my favorite games list because of that impact. As I said at the top of the hour, Sly 2 is a game that taught me that video games could be something more than just playing to get a high score, or for the intrinsic appeal of jumping around as your favorite licensed superhero. I had never seen a journey be this complex or emotionally resonant in anything I had ever seen before. It raised the bar for what my expectations from games were and made me a proper video game enthusiast. You can call it being nostalgia blind or whatever the heck you want. It doesn't matter to me, and this will always be one of my favorite gaming experiences to ever exist because of the talent and passion on display from the people who made it, trying to do something really special, and that's why Sly 2 is one of my favorite games of all time. And at that point, do I really need to say much more? Today, playing Sly 2 doesn't really get that much of a reaction out of me because I've played it so many times that I pretty much sucked all the juice out of that lemon. But in spite of that fact, I won't ever forget Sly 2 or the Sly Trilogy simply because of that impact I've been discussing. Having said all that, next week we're going to wrap up this Sly Trilogy 20th Anniversary celebration by talking about the finale, Sly 3 Honor Among Thieves, a game I love quite a bit that is also my least favorite game in the trilogy by far. So that should hopefully be interesting. So until then, I'll say what I always do. Thank you all for watching, and I'll see you next time.